Kia ora. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that today is Suffrage Day, uh, and the Government remains very committed to our programme of work in the space of gender equality and equity. I'm particularly proud that we've um, increased women's representation on public sector boards and committees to the point that it now is at 52.5 per cent, and in 2021, almost 55 per cent of new appointments were women. And as a Parliament in October, we will hit a significant milestone of having 50 per cent female MPs, something for the whole Parliament to be proud of. As you'll be aware, the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, will attend the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II in London tonight, New Zealand time. The Prime Minister is accompanied by a number of New Zealanders representing our communities to provide tributes on behalf of all of us. As previously announced, here at home we will mark the passing of the Queen with a state memorial service and one-off public holiday next Monday, the 26th of September. I'm able to provide some further details on that event today. The state memorial service will be held in the Wellington Cathedral of St Paul from 2pm on Monday. At the start of the service at 2pm, a national minute of silence will be observed. Both the Prime Minister and Governor-General will then speak at the service following their return from the Queen's funeral. The full service will be broadcast and live streamed so all New Zealanders have the opportunity to observe and further details on where you can watch this will be circulated shortly. Here on Parliament's grounds, two large screens will be set up to broadcast the service to those who wish to gather here. I also understand that locally organised services will be held around the country, and in particular in Auckland and Christchurch on Monday evening. I know that many people will take up the opportunities around the country to pay their respects, and it's important for us to provide this ability for the country to come together for one day to mark 70 years of extraordinary public service. Before I move to questions, I want to briefly outline the week ahead. On Tuesday uh, evening, the House will enter urgency to pass under all stages the Holidays Amendment Bill to enact next Monday's public holiday. We'll also pass the final stage of the budget legislation, which we delayed uh, from last week. And on Thursday, the Maniapoto Claim Settlement Bill will have its final reading as well. The Prime Minister will be travelling from London to New York after the funeral to attend the United Nations General Assembly. On Wednesday morning our time, the heads of government will be welcomed to the General Assembly for the opening of the general debate. On that day also, the Prime Minister will host the Christchurch Call Summit alongside French President Emmanuel Macron uh, to progress the goals of the call, which, as you know, are to seek to eliminate terrorism and violent extremism content online. In New York, uh, the Prime Minister will also deliver a keynote speech at the Earthshot Prize, and she makes her key General Assembly address early Saturday morning New Zealand time. In addition to the, these other engagements, she will have a number of bilaterals with counterparts, as well as engagements with Pacific Island leaders through the week. I should note on Friday that Ministers Mahuta and O'Connor will make a climate finance announcement in regards to climate smart agriculture around the world. And speaking of Minister O'Connor, it's worth noting that he is overseas this week uh, developing trade relationships in India and Indonesia. These both represent significant markets for New Zealand and he will also be representing New Zealand at the G20 trade ministerial meeting. Happy to take your questions. Party to dump their Sam Uffendale statement today here at the Queen's funeral? I think it was pretty disrespectful and definitely pretty cynical. And the timing you think? Why, why do you say that? Well, there were certainly other options, weren't there, for making an announcement like this. And I've been around here for quite a long time. I've seen, you know, people decide to put things out on particular days, but um, there were certainly other ways of handling it that wouldn't have put it out on today, wouldn't, wouldn't they? What's your, what's your thoughts on the on the review findings or the investigation findings? And um, you know, how do you think um, victims of bullying will will take to those findings? Oh, look, the National Party and, and Christopher Luxon have to defend the approach that they've taken here. Um, I think we should all take very seriously assault and bullying allegations, um, no matter where we are and what workplace we're in. Mr. Mr. Robertson, uh, is there a sense for you that, uh, that if this was Labour, if, if, this, if the same shoe was on, on Labour's foot, that National would go after Labour to no end? Oh, look, you know, I don't know what the National Party do. It's always hard to tell. What I do know is that there were certainly options for the National Party about when they did this. I believe they held a, 
a caucus meeting today. They had one scheduled for tomorrow, didn't they? Would you be proud to call Mr Ruffendell a caucus member of yours? Well, he's not. That's the point, uh, Ben. And the National Party need to defend the way that they've handled this and who knew what when and all of those sorts of questions. That's up to them. Um, we've got important work to be uh, getting underway with. But I just want to reiterate, I think in any workplace around... Uh, around New Zealand, we should be upholding the highest possible standards and it's important that all of us make sure that we look after all the people around us. I think personality out of the NASA the policy sense that Mr um, Uffendell obviously campaigned on law and order, order issues. Um, he says various things in his, in his maiden speech um, that don't really ring true with his personal experience. Do you think it blunts National's attempts to be a tough on crime party? Well, I think it's very important to be consistent on all matters of public policy. And, um, you know, the public do have a, a fairly good radar when it comes to inconsistency and in the way people treat different policy issues. And certainly when it comes to issues around crime and youth crime, you know, it's important not only to, you know, make sure we stop that from occurring but get to the root causes of it. What do you think it says about transparency in terms of not releasing the terms of reference or any of the report? And can you say as a senior leader that if there are allegations of bullying or any other sort of nature against an MP in your caucus that you expect that there should be, if there is a level of a report, that you expect that there should be terms of reference and at least um, an executive summary of some description released? Well, what I can say is what we did. So when we had the issue that we had uh, with a staff member um, that Maria Jew actually undertook that investigation, we did release an executive summary and I'm sure you and others would be expecting the same thing from National. Minister, have you got any updated costings of how much the uh, public holiday will cost next month? Nothing more than what was announced last week. So MB looked at it and came up with a range, which, if I recall, was uh, somewhere between a, a net positive of about $30 million and a net negative of about $130 million. Uh, I think, obviously, these things can be uneven in the sense that uh, some businesses, particularly in the hospitality area, for example, no doubt will have uh, plenty of custom. Mm -hmm. Others, where there'll be a cost where they may not be able to open for whatever reason, there might be a cost against them. So, you know, these things are... Uh, will be felt differently around the community. But in the end, we've made a decision here that we believe this is the right thing to do to show respect to somebody who has been our head of state for more than 70 years. Um, it's a, effectively a one in 70 year event. So you think if people use that public holiday just to have a holiday, go shopping down the beach or what have you, that they're showing disrespect to the Queen? Oh, look, I think most New Zealanders will take some time on the day to reflect on, on the role that Queen Elizabeth II has played in New Zealand society. Um, equally on other public holidays, um, when we have Christmas or whatever, people um, spend that in different ways. We want to give people the opportunity to do that. It's a mark of respect from the government, from Parliament, when the, when the bill passes, uh, and different New Zealanders will treat the day differently. An estimate of how much the service and the broadcasting will cost? No, I don't have that uh, estimate at all, but I'm sure we'll be able to get that through for you. In Australia, the uh, Treasury there a few weeks ago released a report on long COVID showing uh, 31,000 people each day aren't mm. showing up to work because of it, you know, $300 million cost to the economy. Have we got any similar measures here? Do you think that tr our Treasury should be? conducting a similar analysis? Uh, to answer the question, we, we haven't done that uh, depth of analysis. We do have a long COVID expert advisory group. I think it was established in May and it is obviously looking at all of the issues that uh, are surrounding that work. I believe the Ministry of Health may have just recently um, put through the health system a call for uh, expressions of interest and some research into uh, long COVID. I think that's uh, an important thing um, for us to do. And so like everyone in the world, we'll be continuing to track this. It's obviously a very new situation and you know, I don't even think there's a diagnostic tool per se for it at the moment and so therefore for people who are experiencing it um, it'll be you know, potentially challenging. I think it's important that they feel heard when they go and see their GP. I know that GPs have been issued with I think what's called pathways or guidelines around how to, how to work with somebody who's expressing the fact that they might have long COVID but we're all learning as we go and I have no doubt there'll be more work done on this in time. It's important, though, as the finance minister, for you to have a sense of, you know, what the impact of this could be on the economy. Quite a lot of people getting disabled, potentially never being able to work again. Yeah, look, and I take seriously anything in that regard. Um, it's just very, very early days, Mark, for that. But I'm sure in, in time the Treasury will work with our colleagues from the Ministry of Health on these matters. 
related COVID question, there seems to be a bit of confusion over whether masks are required to be worn in GP clinics. Do you, are you able to clarify that? Because the COVID website seems to say one thing and the Twitter page seems to say another. Oh, well, we should always be very careful about getting your news from Twitter. Uh, what I, uh, look, what I'd say is I don't think anything's changed. The situation in GP clinics has been managed over the, the last couple of years and, and no rules particularly have changed on that. I think the situation here is that uh, the, the announcement that was made last week was about visitors. So I think we can all imagine the situation of someone visiting an aged care facility, for example, and thinking, well, that person should be wearing a mask. When it comes to patients, and as I say, this is not a new thing, um, there isn't always the ability for a patient to wear a mask sometime for the reason of the of why they're in the clinic. Some also there is concern about whether that might act as a barrier to people um, seeking um, health care. But most GP clinics have been running a very similar system over the last couple of years where for the most part they do require people to wear masks when they go to the clinic. That hasn't changed. It's it's in their hands. So it's it's a government rule to require people. No, because it's a rule about visitors um, to healthcare settings. On income insurance. Um, when can we expect a draft bill that creates a scheme to be introduced? Yeah, yeah, we're working towards, we obviously want to pass the legislation by um, election time next year. Don't have a date for that yet, but if you work your way backwards from, you know, a likely time towards the end of next year, we'll be needing to get legislation introduced hopefully before the end of this year. And are you committed to having both redundancy and illness covered by that scheme? It's certainly the government's plan. It always has been. Our belief is that in addition to redundancy, health conditions and disability should be dealt with. Um, we think this is a good opportunity, as I've said a few times, to make sure that we fill some gaps in our social security system. Um, and that's certainly the plan that we've gone forward with. Okay. And um, businesses... Uh who might not be happy with that? Are you willing to give them any sort of relief in any way? Might, might be happy with health sort of conditions. Paying, paying levies. Or paying levies at and, all. And for it to and for it to cover um, illness, not just redundancy. Well, obviously, it is, it's a levy-based scheme that we've proposed, and so therefore, in order for it to work, there will be employer levies, so I can't, obviously can't promise that. We're still working through the final design of the scheme, um, um, making sure that we take on board all of the feedback that we've got. Obviously, when it comes you know, to the, the detail of how the legislation will be expressed, the language in there, that's, you know, we've got to get that right. So we're working our way through those issues, but you know, our intention is to introduce a levy-based scheme. Do you expect the details of that um, scheme to be uh, announced or included in the budget, um, given that it, it may involve some fiscal costs? Certainly already put some money in the previous budget um, to help establish and set up the scheme. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we're not intending, as we've said before, for it to be operational before 2024. Um, so um, we'll take a look at that during the budget process as to what's needed, but um, it's not going to be operational until at least 2024. But you would have to include it in the forecast for the year. Potentially, yep. Yeah. The, the Child Poverty Action Group's worried that the creation of the scheme will stymie um, reviews of our welfare system more broadly, and they're really worried about creating a two-tier welfare system. Can you give them? Can you give New Zealand your assurance that you'll keep focusing on um, improving the welfare system as well as? Um, establishing this? Absolutely, and that's what we've done. You know, so while I know we haven't implemented all of the recommendations of the Welfare Expert Advisory Group, we've taken moves over the last few years to significantly increase the support that we provide to our lowest income New Zealanders. We've lifted main benefit rates in 2020, 2021 and 2022. We continue to look to how we can improve issues like child support pass on, um, other issues that were raised by the Welfare Expert Advisory Group. Um, to me, this is about creating uh, a full social security system. And there's been a gap in our system when it comes to income insurance. Most countries in the OECD have this. Uh, we are bringing it in, but we're bringing it in over time, and we will continue to work on other issues within the welfare system, absolutely. Do you think this could be a useful um, vehicle in which to help, uh, effectively help middle-income New Zealanders without giving them cash that might increase inflation right now? Well, obviously, it's not been it was never intended to be brought in right now. But um, so it's not about it's not about dealing with the particular circumstance of inflation we have today. 
our motivation for doing this is that both after the Christchurch earthquakes and then again um, in the period of COVID, we've created ad hoc schemes to deal with people having sudden job loss. Uh, we felt that this was a gap. Um, the Council of Trade Unions and Business New Zealand jointly came to us and said, we think this scheme would be a good scheme, not just for supporting uh, people through those changes in their lives, but also to help provide a workforce that was ready and able to shift and change into different areas. And so for all of those reasons we've done this, it's not ever particularly been motivated by questions around inflation or how people would spend money. But it could be quite a useful vehicle to deliver some middle class welfare that wasn't inflationary in an election year. Well, as I say, I think you'll recall I announced uh, the intention to do it at Budget 2021. We're working our way through it. I do think it's something that will be very beneficial for um, low and middle income earners in New Zealand. So to that extent, yes, I'm, I think it's something that people in those income brackets will appreciate. On the online traveller declaration, what discussions has Cabinet had about the worth of that continuing to need to be filled out by citizens and residents in New Zealand? Yes, yeah, so the discussions that Cabinet has had is that this is long term how we want to deal with people arriving in New Zealand and eventually things like the arrival card will no longer be necessary and the decision that Cabinet had to make was given the changes in our COVID stance, did we stop the traveller declaration and then restart it again at a point in the future when we were starting to get rid of arrival cards. We didn't think that was a sensible thing to do and so we're continuing it while we work towards getting away from that paper-based system and more into an electronic one. So the idea is you get rid of the customs card and you add the whole, have you got each different... Everything, different everything ends different up in a digital one. format. And presumably make it a better system because it's a fairly rubbish one at the moment. I'm sure all systems can be improved and send us an email, Joe, with your thoughts. Correction, this Minister have report to Cabinet any concerns around the fact that face-to-face -face visits for prisoners haven't been happening for quite some time now? I'd have to go back and check, Mikey, uh, about that. In terms of uh, where we're at on those visiting um, uh, situations, clearly um, we've got staffing issues. That's common in many sectors of society and the economy at the moment. Uh, now we're in a position with the borders open, with things opening up a bit more, uh, that there is you know, far more ability to be able to recruit. I know corrections are getting a much higher level of response than they've had to uh, their job advertisements, we then got to get the people in and train them. So recognise that this has been a very, very difficult time, uh, but I think we are starting to make progress. Quite a different situation to other industries that are facing staffing shortages though, isn't it? Because these are actually families who have been kept apart because of a lack of staffing. Um, and so ultimately families and prisoners are paying the price for a department who can't staff its operations. Well, as I say, I put it in the. Con I still think the context is the same context in terms of the fact that yeah, there are staffing shortages. Uh, we have obligations, as you say, to try to uh, make sure that families can um, see each other visit, talk to each other. I know that Corrections has been trying to do that through other means other than in-person visits. They are now increasing the number of in-person visits and we're increasing the staff. Corrections also has obligations on health and safety for their staff that sit alongside their obligations that they have uh, to those families. We've got to get the balance of that right. We know we've got to improve things and as I say, there has been increased interest now in terms of the ads that Corrections are putting out and I'm sure we'll see more staff come on board soon. When asked about um, whether New Zealand should become a republic, Jacinda Ardern, I think other people say it's never been brought up before. It's certainly been brought up now by the members of the public, by members of the public. But when do you think the time is right to have a proper debate about that? Well, as the Prime Minister has said, you know, in her lifetime she expects that there will not only be a debate, but that the, the change will occur. Um, that, that will emerge over time. I think the point she's also made is for our government, we have an awful lot of things on our plate at the moment. Um, we want to make sure we do the right thing by the commitments we made at the 2020 election. Uh, this wasn't one of them, um, but I'm quite sure over time New Zealand will have that debate. She's ruled out that happening under her leadership at all. Yeah, and as over time, as I say, she's got many years left in her lifetime, Ben. <laughs> Let's hope so. Do you expect that... Um, well, can, can I ask you your, your thoughts on what sort of a king you think King Charles III will be? He's obviously come to New Zealand several times. He had a very thought-provoking speech in Waitangi in 2019. Mm. He obviously understands New Zealand's many nuances better than most people probably think. How do you expect he'll take to um, that debate and 
specifically looking after New Zealand? Oh, look, I think, yeah, as the Prime Minister again said um, after meeting him, uh, you know, he's a person with a great deal of interest in what's happened in New Zealand. As you noted, he's visited New Zealand a number of times, um, and I expect he'll visit New Zealand again. Um, he's also a person who has expressed his views on issues that matter to New Zealanders like climate change and, and the environment and so on. And so, you know, I think I think all of those things mean that, you know, he will fulfil his duties uh, well uh, as a monarch. Just on the initial policy statement um, for highly productive land announced yesterday, what advice did Cabinet get about how much that would restrict um, land supply for housing and therefore reduce the number of houses available in, in yeah. the future? Look, I mean, obviously, you know, if we had an open slather on building houses absolutely anywhere, then clearly whenever you have rules, it limits the number of houses that can be built. What um, Cabinet was, or what, as Ministers, we were certainly aware of, is that it is quite possible for us to see intensification in other parts of a city that can make up for uh, land that won't be used uh, because of these changes that we're making. So, per se, you know, I can't recall specific advice, but in general, it is completely possible to be able to continue to build the houses that we need, whilst also protecting land that provides elite soils. So it puts more of the load up on, onto densification for, for cities. What extra resources is the government going to put into public transport uh, funding and infrastructure funding for councils so they can actually deliver enough? Because at the moment they say, you keep telling us to densify, but we get smacked by our, um, our ratepayers and we can't afford it. Well, obviously, we've um, you know had a number of funds to support infrastructure, and the most recent of which is the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund, um, which has already announced projects that we'll be funding to make sure that that infrastructure is there for councils to develop, and we'll continue to work in... ...to projects on the fringes, though. Yeah, well, some of it can, you know, in time, as, as we were on, I'm sure that can go into the cities as well. Uh, development within cities is always tends to be a partnership, so there will be some expectation on local government to be able to step up and do their bit of that. But ultimately, if you, this particular policy is about striking an important balance, I think, and that is the fact that there are areas around the fringes of some of our cities and towns where we do have land that we should be using to be able to feed ourselves and to be able to feed the world, and we can do that as well as build houses in other parts of the community. And I should also add that there is a regime that is possible to work through for an exception to be able to use that land. Just on densification, the Christchurch Council last week um, rejected uh, the law uh, on densification and the Auckland Council has stripped out most of Auckland from the Auckland Plan's um, uh, map to allow densification. Is the government considering taking legal action or appointing commissioners against either council? I don't have any update on that today, Bernard. It's something that I expect we'll be discussing internally and indeed with Christchurch uh, in the future, but I don't have any information about that today. As the, as the MP for Wellington Central, you've seen, you'll have seen signs around town that have uh, for for council candidates that have the same branding as Paul Eagle's signs, is he running candidates against Labour endorsed uh, councillors? Oh, you'd have to ask him that question. Um, he's a he's a as you know an independent candidate endorsed by. He's an independent candidate endorsed by Labour. I have no idea about what he may or may not be doing. If I recall some of the signs, they're yellow and black. That's probably not a big surprise that people in Wellington are using yellow and black signs, and we, while I'm at it, what a great Ranfilly Shield win on the weekend for Wellington too. And will I, 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 Will he be welcome back? Of course he would be. Of course. But, you know, I also think he'll, he'll make a good mayor as well. Uh, an OIA came out on the weekend from police showing an explosion of crime along Fenton Street in Rotorua between 20, 2018 and, and now. I, is the government doing everything it can to protect the reputation of Rotorua as a tourist town in light of 
emergency accommodation and motels? Well, we certainly are working very closely with the Rotorua District Council and with others in the area to make sure that we support all of the people in, in the district. And obviously, there's been some stories in recent times about concerns that have been raised. We take those very, very seriously. More broadly, it's a community where we have invested money and resources in, both through the Provincial Growth Fund, um, our housing work. We've just approved, as mentioned before, um, um, the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund, which is going to support the building of 3,000 houses in the area. So I think we are working closely with the community. It's clearly been a very challenging and difficult period, and no doubt um, you know, those who live in the area um, you know, have had concerns. We've tried to deal with those as they've been raised. Yeah. Uh, what I was asking, though, is whether or not what the government's doing to protect the reputation of Rotorua as a tourist town. It's a, a major mm. economic part of the town. Look, I think, you know, again, through the tourism funding that we've given over the course of the last couple of years, businesses in Rotorua have received... Um, you know, significant amounts of money and support from us. Um, the you know, promotional campaigns is included in that. Um, Rotorua is still a busy tourism town. I know that from talking to people who are there, but there are other issues that need to be dealt with and we'll deal with those. On um, income insurance, sorry, again, um, how similar or different do you think the final scheme will be to what's been proposed? Well, we haven't put the final scheme to Cabinet yet, so I, it's hard for me to give a definitive answer on that question. The point that I've made several times is we believe that there is a gap in our social security system. We think it's important to fill that gap. We have put out a scheme which we think does that, but we're listening to people and we're looking at the fine details, so that will be the decision we'll make. Just, speech, just your speech on Friday in mm. which you talked about um, potentially changing the... Um, sequence of uh, investment to account for the um, struggling or busy uh, infrastructure sector. Uh, are you looking to slow down or delay any of the New Zealand upgrade um, transport investment program over the next year or two because of the, um, the shortages of labour and materials? Yeah, look, we're no different than anybody else who's working in construction or infrastructure in that, um, you know, issues around building supplies, materials, um, labour supply affects us just as it does everybody else. Um, we're continuing on with the NZ Upgrade Programme. Minister Wood and I regularly review it. Um, we do particularly look at issues like phasing and sequencing, um, and so that's an ongoing process, yes, but we're still committed to the projects within the programme. Do you also um, phase it or sequence it to help the budget situation and to take pressure off inflation? Uh, well, certainly in the, on the first of those, the money's allocated, so, you know, that's there as we work through. It's, to, it's not to take pressure off the budget, capital B, it's to make sure that we can manage the programme and the programme budget. Um, and in terms of inflation, it's not a particular driver for us, but we're very aware in terms of that, but we're very aware of the fact that we're working in quite a limited um, marketplace in terms of labour and in terms of building materials and so on, but it's not that we're sitting there trying to save um, points off inflation by the New Zealand upgrade programme. So should we expect some sort of resequencing in the next few weeks? Um, it, we continually look at the projects. Finance Minister, did any public funding go towards questionable last minute uh, refereeing decisions in the Bledisloe Cup? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I saw there was the real importance of making sure that you listen to the referee uh, and um, listen to your fellow players who were also telling you to listen to the referee. I'm, I'm, I'm the son of a rugby referee. I know how hard the job is, but, you know, in the end, a, a good outcome was achieved. Thanks, everyone.